Hello and welcome to Go With The Heat. I'm Dominic. I'm John. I'm Melissa. And this is your cultural guide to the phenomenon that was Miami Vice. This week we're talking about Season 4, Episode 2, titled Amen, Send Money. See, I put the ladder in there, writers. I did it for you. You put the dot, dot, dot. I read it as dot, dot, dot. <laughs> <laughs> it originally premiered on, on October 2nd, 1987. It is written by John Schulian. Schulian? <laughs> I'm hoping I'm getting that right because he also wrote down for the count part one and two. Oh, okay. So he's got some right. We got to get oh, him. Don't some worry. The name will get better as we go along. <laughs> So <laughs> he also wrote two teleplays in season three. He's got another episode coming. Very seasoned Dick Wolf vice writer. The director is James Quinn. Now, here's where it gets interesting. I might explain a lot of things in this episode. He also directed Lend Me an Ear and Viking Bikers from Hell. That explains a lot. Oh, yeah. OK, I, 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 I understand a lot more now. <laughs> Both episodes that cover very strange topics in a weird way. And have terrible endings. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Very yes. Uh, clumsy endings. And so I add this one to the list of clumsy endings. Are we sure this guy's not actually like a fake name like the last one? <laughs> Every time a bad one comes up, they got to bury it on some poor guy. Yeah. <laughs> Aliens. Uh-huh. <laughs> Before I get started, I can check in and see what's going on in each other's lives. And guys, we've been talking about this more and more recently. The late 80s is back. And we talked about Roseanne last week, about that TV show coming back. And we talked about how there might be a potential Miami Vice reboot, which sounds like it's already done. Like they're going to they're gonna make that. And you, can't it get any weirder than Miami Vice and Roseanne? Well, I'll say Yes. The distinct possibility is very high. Yeah. What's the last TV show you would thought from the 80s that you thought, like, I wish they would bring that one back? I can tell you the exact opposite of that. Of all the shows that are coming back, the only one I wish would come back is Alf. Because we need Alf more than ever right now. There's too (laughs) many cats. We do. Hey. We do. (laughs) They're going to bring back Murphy Brown. Okay. That's a thing that... Are they going to bring back Murphy Brown to like the actress? Yeah. Oh, yeah. She's already agreed to be in it. Um, I didn't know that Murphy Brown was so popular. I didn't watch that show. I didn't. <laughs> I didn't and know Sybil Shepard was still alive. Well, wait, you got that wrong. <laughs> First of all, you got it wrong because it's not Sybil Shepard. <laughs> so, <laughs> I didn't even know. I, can't even, I couldn't even tell uh, you. I think her name is Candace Bergen. Oh, okay. So that Candace sounds, Bergen. That sounds familiar oh, too. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, and it's about like... She works for a she works for a TV show. Simple Shepherd was in a it was also in the CBS show in the nineties though, not the eighties. So but yes, Candace Bergen. CBS, they all just it makes more one sense. person. Yeah, it's CBS. It makes <laughs> yeah, it makes a it's lot of sense. It's starting to make more sense. Like, like old people, Murphy Brown. Okay, okay, I'm starting to track here. <laughs> yeah, I didn't know that it was like a, a feminist thing. But I mean, a lot of people that I follow on social media that are like known for their feminist ways <laughs> and stances, <laughs> they're very excited about it because she was like a strong, independent woman. Like she had a child out of wedlock yeah. on purpose. And, she, and that was a big deal. It was a big deal in the 80s because she was like a strong, single female businesswoman type, you know. Um, and there weren't a lot of role models like that back then. But I don't know how that applies to today. To me, what the unfortunate thing is, is that they just do a straight reboot instead of taking that idea and giving new actors and writers and everything an opportunity to just take that idea, but then modernize it. But instead, they're going to get Candace Bergen and... Well, I I bet you what it's going to be is like, I'm just speculating, but she had a child in that. She had like a daughter. So I bet you it's going to be like the reboot is going to be about the daughter and she's just going to kind of be in it. I just don't understand this theme that we're in right now. It's like, why can't you just let things stand on their own instead of also adding this nostalgia layer to everything new? Mm-hmm. I, I think they don't have anything new. <laughs> I think that's the problem. Well, all I know is that it's safe to dust off your shoulder pads and bring them out of the closet. She had some huge ones <laughs> in her business suits. <laughs> in news that we can all agree with, though, with the late 80s coming back, that's good, is that Miami Vice continues to be a theme in these comebacks. And the Miami Heat just showed off their latest city edition of their NBA jerseys. And they are Vice-themed jerseys down to hot pink and the pastel blues with the shadows behind the numbers. They are fantastic. Yeah. I'm not a ba- I am not a basketball fan. 
nor am I at Miami Heat. <laughs> but I am now. <laughs> yeah. But I would totally own one of these. I really wish I was a fan now because I would totally own one too. Unfortunately, that is not the case. <laughs> <laughs> and I can't even pretend is what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> Support Bill Russell and the teams he played for. <laughs> well, speaking of something that we don't want to come back from the 80s, it's these TV evangelists that are all over this episode. And another great ripped from the headlines piece because this was such a big deal in the 80s. So let's go break down this episode and let's see how it fares by the end because I have a strong opinion about this by the time we get to the end of this episode. Let's go talk about this. I one. just have one question at the end. <laughs> um. <laughs> All right, so before we get started, we do want to mention that this episode, although it's about TV evangelists, part of the story is rape allegations. And in this episode, they end up being false accusations against Tubbs. And that's what he's fighting against throughout this entire episode is that they're trying to undermine his character. This also comes at a very coincidental time for us when we're watching this show to what's happening right now inside of the United States with the Time's Up and the Me Too movements. So we do want to acknowledge that while we're watching this episode, we are thinking of those things and how it pertains to modern culture and what was happening in the 80s versus the movements that are happening now and then the span in which those things have happened. We just don't feel like this is the right place where we can continue to have that conversation. This is a podcast about Miami Vice and not for covering uh, very crucial conversations that we should be having as a society about treatment of women in the United States and in various industries in the United States and all over the world. We are acknowledging it here up front that we are aware of just the, the timing that we found this episode and what's currently happening in our culture, uh, but we're not going to talk about that particular topic in this podcast. There are lots of other people who would be able to talk about this much better than us. <laughs> <laughs> I can tell you that. <laughs> let's, let's make fun of some televangelists. Yes. <laughs> I agree to that. So when we open up this episode, we are a mix between out on the street and watching TV. On TV, we have what's probably the best named vice character ever in Bill Bob proverb. <laughs> Bill Bob. <laughs> Every <No>. <laughs> Bill Bob. <laughs> and he's beaming down to all 320 satellite cable channels right from his studio into your home. And God and he... wants you to give him $10. <laughs> <laughs> he says, feel good. Send money. <laughs> 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 Let's get down the brass tax. Daddy needs a new BMW. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's comes... basically the speech he's giving. He's talking right. about how, hey, I enjoy the nice things. I'm getting manicures, you know? <laughs> I'm wearing an expensive Italian suit. Keep sending me money. I do not buy that that is an expensive Italian suit. <laughs> I do not think they have fluorescent, <laughs> shimmery gold colors <laughs> in Italian suits. I don't, well, I don't buy it. <laughs> <laughs> He does just come right, right out but, and say it, too, that he's taking all the money for himself. Screw those poor kids in Rwanda. Yeah. <laughs> but I am slightly distracted because of what's going on on the street where we have tubs that I initially thought was undercover as a hooker. We thought that, too. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'd pick him up. <laughs> he looks like he was on vacation. He comes walking up, starts talking to Leona in the car. And I'm like, is he hooking it? <laughs> is, is he hooking? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but thankfully it turns out he's just selling mike and ike's <laughs> <laughs> yeah. this woman that pulls up she's in a nice expensive car and is cutting back and forth between bell bob talking about how you should send him money that he's going to keep it all for himself and tub selling drugs to this woman in the car and bell bob just credit to this man saying he's going to promise you a pathway to God through materialism. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't get much more 80s than what Bill Bob is talking about. On the street, though, Tubbs is finalizing that drug deal. And when he finally, at the end, he pulls out his badge and says, I got one last thing. He pulls out his badge. You're under arrest. She says, I've been to jail. Jail sucks. 
and then tries to drive away. That makes Crockett finally pay attention because yes. he's over hanging out with the hookers. The hookers are touching him, <laughs> yeah. getting, like laughing, <laughs> not paying attention to yeah, him. Yeah, he's getting proud. <laughs> Crockett turns around. His reaction is great because he immediately pulls his gun out and just fires at her. <laughs> he just shoots in the air. She freaks out, gets in an accident, and tries to drive away again, crashes into a TV store, which is still selling black and white TVs, which bonus. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They're budget friendly. And then when they pull her out of the car, she's still all woozy from the wreck and the drugs. She's yeah, on. and the drugs. <laughs> That's a key part to that. Uh-huh. They hold her up and they can see it on the plane on the TVs is the IGG network in God's glory. Network, and she is performing on TV. She's singing about Jesus. <laughs> that makes her famous, oh, sort yeah. of. <laughs> I, I, I mean, like, how famous can you be on the IG whatever network? Like, IGG. That, that, I mean, <laughs> like, that's like being famous on PBS. <laughs> Suck it, Bob Ross. Hey! <laughs> <laughs> You leave Bob Ross alone. I was thinking about it as more of a cut on Stuart Smiley, but okay. <laughs> Mr. Rogers. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> and then we cut to the opening. Dude, that credits. was a long open, too. Yes, it was. It was extremely long. In fact, it might be one of the longer ones we've had since like season two. Back in season two, they'd do like the half of the episode before they finally cut to the opening credits. Back in the good yeah. old days. <laughs> <laughs> Before we move on, we do want to stop and talk about our gigantic guest star that we have right in the beginning. He's not our biggest guest star. We have a much bigger one coming later. But this one is big for the 80s. Playing Re- Reverend Bill Bob, Bilbo. We'll call him <laughs> Bilbo Reverend Bilbo. Baggins. <laughs> Played by Brian Dennehy, who has been in some pretty big movies like Cocoon, Tommy Boy, Assault on Precinct 13. That was a decent movie. There's a ton <laughs> of TV movies, too. And actually, he's he got six Emmy nominations for some of those TV movies, but no wins. No one appreciates Brian Dennehy. <laughs> His first appearance was on an episode of Kojak. He's one of those people that's always looked like my grandpa. <laughs> it's just always like that way. <laughs> Every time I think of Brian Den, he all I think is The Simpsons, where they go to see a movie and there's a work jumble before, and it turns out it's Odom Shank, which is he has the answer to Brian Dennehy. <laughs> 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 well, when we come back from the opening credits, we're down at the Miami Dade jail, and the lady's lawyer, her name is Leona. Leona's lawyer is talking to probably like the assistant DA and the duo. And they're arguing that she should be released. She's a first-time offender. She's crying about how she's going to hell and feel the icy hands of death. But yes, if it's the, the devil, devil made her do it. But why is the devil icy? Why is it like hot hands of... <laughs> uh, like, what? <laughs> Tubbs just keeps rolling his eyes at Leona, too. His face throughout this whole episode is always like... Oh God! I swear to God, like God. Can you blame him? <laughs> I mean, this episode's a little rough. Yeah, on deal him. with these crazy ass <laughs> white people. <laughs> I mean, this episode, you know, one where you're falsely accused of rape. I think you might be entitled to roll your eyes a little bit. <laughs> the lawyer asked the assistant DA to step out, so the lawyer is talking to him in the hallway. It's like, let her plead, get off, and no chiming the. Person's like, we've already done this three he, Dominic, times. Like, no, the filming's gonna stick. Dominic, he's clearly talking to him in his office, which just looks like the hallway. <laughs> <laughs> the assistant DA also says that they have a video back in the room. Leona's still crying about the devil being in her car and the devil's in her body, in this body. <laughs> <laughs> back outside the da is saying they have video but no audio swy tech again he was banging on the tv hard he was trying to fix it he had a hot dog in one hand and smacking the monitor with the other <laughs> he had a partner <laughs> the assistant da says look with her in possession and tubs impeachable record we're going to proceed. So then when they go back into the room, the lawyer is talking to Leona. The assistant DA leans over to the duo and says, hey, this is going to be a troublesome case. It's going to be a PR disaster. Uh, it all banks on your testimony, Tubbs. And oh, then- oh, and this is the best part. The, the lawyer 
then threatens that this means war and indicates that Christian people do not play nice. <laughs> no. um, they, 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 I guess they don't have these any kind of morals or anything. <laughs> um, I don't think we should comment on that. <laughs> and Leona drops the act, too. She says, Bale's made, let's blow. Yeah, I know. I don't really got the devil in me, okay? I've done this before. Come on. <laughs> Later on the IGG network, Bill Bob is saying that the police are persecuting his wife and this network and in the and using God in vain. And we need money. Reach into your pockets and help give to Leona's defense fund at 1-800-555-LOVE. <laughs> <laughs> Which also sounds like you'll reach the ladies, man, depending on what time of day you call. <laughs> <laughs> Say 1-800, not 1-900. <laughs> After the show, Bill Bob is laying into Leona, though. It's like, we've done this too many times. I've wasted so much money on your addiction. Why did we even get your blood changed out in <laughs> Switzerland? <laughs> well, wait a minute. I want to learn more about the blood change in Switzerland. <laughs> That's what got the devil in her. The blood change. <laughs> and this is the last time Bell Bob is helping Leona. Then as they're walking and talking down the hallway, he's talking like his director or producer talking about how high the ratings were. Bill Bob sees a young redhead and they lock eyes. And now this is the time where you think, okay, so what else is Bill Bob up to? Young redheads, apparently. Yeah. <laughs> as we find think. out later, he refers to them as angels. Pervert. No, but we never <laughs> find out anything later about any of that. We just don't talk about that, okay? So meanwhile, Tubbs is at home. Now, hold on. You heard me right. We travel to the Tubbs residence. <laughs> the Tubbs residence. I don't believe it. <laughs> Tubbs Manor. That's not his house. Calls it. <laughs> that, that, that's some um, stakeout house we haven't seen yet, but we'll see in a future episode. <laughs> he gets a call patched through from Miami-Dade, and it's the redhead, whose name is Faye. And she says... She it's was compelled by God to call him. <laughs> and then Tubbs says, quote, Run, Tubbs. What, are you, <laughs> and then Tubbs says, what are you smoking? Snorting or drinking? <laughs> 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 Tubbs tries to hang up, but she says that she knows that Leno's in the big stuff and she's afraid. So you need to come talk to me right now. So I don't want to tell you over the phone, but I got big news for you, Mr. Police Officer. So she's obviously crazy, but he's going to go over there anyway. Like, how is this going to turn out well like, at all? Yeah, yeah, that's what I said. I go, why did he go over there? Why didn't he get like someone to come with him or something? At least just make a call into the station and say, hey, I'm heading over here. Why doesn't he get the ladies? Because that's what they usually, they don't even deal with yeah, the, like what, lady stuff. Yeah, whatever happened to making Trudy do all the work. <laughs> wakes her up get out of bed come on <laughs> so then the scene just suddenly jumps to the studio is that where they're at yeah, i don't there's know there's got to be a security guard yeah, so it must it be is. at the it's studio. studio because it's like some they say some guard was mm -hmm. patrolling the studio or something and Faye says that she works as an usher for bill bob but she doesn't want to really betray bill bob like he treats me right and then suddenly just throws herself on Tubbs and starts screaming rape as Tubbs like wrestles oh, oh, yeah. control of her. It, that's when a, se a security was, guard shows up. Yeah, like, dude, it was so sudden in the mid sentence. Like, she just rips her dress and starts screaming. She gets into it really fast. Tubbs, you can see from his perspective, like, he didn't have any time to really react. But this was great planning, too, because it was like, the security guard in the right place. Everything lined up perfectly for this setup. By the way, our. Rape Accuser, played by Joe Anderson. You might have seen her in 10 episodes of Beauty and the Beast, or 10 episodes of Sisters, or 6 episodes of Roswell. Weird that there's another Miami Vice connection there with Ron Perlman. Oh yeah, that is mm -hmm. weird. I didn't think about that. So now we get a Miami Vice rarity. <laughs> a first, almost. <laughs> yeah, almost never happens. The next day, Croc is going down to see Tubbs. He's, they're still interviewing him. He comes walking up. And the IA is already there, and it's IA Detective Stro, who we've jerk. already seen the exact same guy, same actor, and everything. They didn't even get a different actor yeah. to play him. <laughs> <laughs> Stro is saying, I'll give you a few minutes with Crockett. Crockett comes in and starts talking to Tubbs. Crockett says, Stro doesn't have anything on you. You were supposed to be there. They have records of the call. There's no reason why they should suspect you of anything here. But this is Stro." Who desperately wants to bring down 
both Crockett and Tubbs, or at least one of them. Specifically Crockett, if he could. Yeah, and, Cro- but yeah. Yeah, and Crockett's taking this pretty lightly. And, and as Tubbs lets Crockett know, uh, he is in some some mess, pretty much. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Crockett doesn't seem to be taking it very seriously. <laughs> Tubbs does have a point here, though. He says, it's a weird setup. I don't know why this TV evangelist would want to do this to me, but they certainly picked out the right person. Not only does... Tubbs have the evidence on Leona being the one to testify, but also as a black off-duty cop at the time. They do have a lot of ways that they could use this in their legal defense and why they singled him out. And then Stro comes walking back in with security images of the incident showing that there was a struggle. Tubbs just slams his fist down on the table. Later that day... And no, thank hard, God I'm, we got that resolved. Now we can move <laughs> on with the episode. <laughs> they do call dad and dad says be gentle with stroke because he doesn't like you yeah don't make him mad <laughs> don't make it hard on yourselves <laughs> dad's office is pretty i think dad's a little hungover <laughs> it's a little dark in there he likes it pretty dark though <laughs> At the same time, Faye is taking a lie detector test, and she says that Bill Bob did tell her to talk to Tubbs about the crime, but obviously she didn't know how Tubbs was going to respond when she met up with him. When the lie detector testing ends, this is when it gets really interesting. Here. <laughs> Crockett goes in and tries to talk to Lou who is performing the lie detector test. And he wants to know the results of it, but she won't tell him anything. And he puts her arm around her, gets real close and kisses her on the cheek and says, I'll get you some dolphins tickets sexual if you help me out right here. Yeah, yeah and that's me. exactly what I was thinking. Is sexual harassment <laughs> the proper path to change rape allegations? <laughs> yes, <laughs> clearly. Apparently it is when it involves dolphins tickets. <laughs> I just don't know what's happening here. Like, this is an episode about false rape accusations. And the way to make it better is to see the charming Sonny Crockett sexually <laughs> harassing the office staff. Yes. <laughs> I hate my actually have a case here. <laughs> Moo does concede and says that Faye really does think that God told her. and She's not lying about any of it. She thinks that all this stuff really happened. And there's no use in con- con- continuing to talk to her because she's going to dig the hole even deeper for Tubbs. And, but she also wants, she wants three Dolphins tickets, by the way. Yeah, by the end of it, she's like, I need three. <laughs> three games. She, she's she, a good negotiator. And she's got some stories. She starts <laughs> telling them about pickpockets. And at times she made roast beef. <laughs> there's just too much 80s happening in that scene for me too is or so far in this episode we have tv evangelists open sexual harassment black people being charged with false allegations like it's just all piling up all in one single episode but that, that's still the 80s though some of that stuff <laughs> true. some of that stuff uh, applies now <laughs> true true open sexual harassment Except for the televangelists maybe but <laughs> yeah true very true so crockett takes off to go talk to someone named mason mathers who was like a competitor and also former uh partner with bill bomb and crockett's interviewing him and mason Mathers is like i don't have anything bad to say about the man i don't like him but I don't have anything this is, ill to say about him. This is a very interesting conversation because Crockett's basically, he's trying to provoke him by saying, hey, you know, this guy's kicking your butt in ratings. Like, why don't you give me some dirt on him? And the good master Marshall Mathers or Eminem or whatever <laughs> he calls himself in a very slimy way, basically like, oh, I don't believe in talking smack, but he's totally nailing these young women. All over the place. You know, little angels. It's just really double talking. Smack about him. <laughs> this is another one of our big guest stars. When you see who plays Mason Mathers, you will immediately recognize him. Played by James uh, Tolkien, who also was in the Back to the Future franchise. And he was also in Top Gun. Um, he was also in Tracy. <laughs> it's also Dick Tracy. You, you know, the one that caught me off guard was that he was in the Amityville Horror. And I, was, I, I didn't remember him being in that. No, I don't remember um, it either. And then for you TV, classic TV buffs, he was in 22 episodes of the show Cobra. Oh, gotcha. <laughs> so now we're going to jump over to Bill Bob's for the first time. 
And Crockett comes driving up, and he's talking to Gina, Gina. I think. Yeah, it's Gina. Saying that Chubb's got Bell Bob's address by swiping it off of Switech's desk. <laughs> Sorry. Switech. <laughs> Swipe or no swipe. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Swiped it off of Switech. <laughs> Come on, Stan. Come on. Not starting off season four on a strong note here. He was in the bathroom, okay? You can't watch everything. <laughs> Inside. Doing a bathroom sandwich? <laughs> <laughs> Probably. Inside, Tubbs is talking to Bill Bob. Tub- Tubbs just wants to know what religion will support false rape allegations. And Bill Bob's like, I don't know. It is a religion that doesn't want off duty and suspended police officers harassing people at their homes. <laughs> <Uh-oh>. <laughs> <laughs> and just Reverend then, Bobo probably- gets pretty cocky here. <laughs> He's cocky through the whole thing. <laughs> Gangster evangelist. <laughs> <laughs> That's when Crockett comes walking up to you and says, you'll have to excuse my dumbass partner. He's being really stupid right now. I need to take him away. I'm here to take him home. <laughs> For once, Tubbs is doing something stupid and he Crockett has to save him, unlike the other way usually. Mm-hmm. <laughs> As Bilbo weaves talking to Tubbs and Crockett, he does say that he is burdened with the sacrifice of the millions of people who follow him to take on and living the life of luxury for them. And that that's his curse of living. Yeah. And then he goes and holds a press conference with his wife immediately after where she she now accuses Ricardo Tubbs. She, she says his full name of trying to rape her, too, which made me wonder, does, does that mean Tubbs can't do undercover work anymore? I thought that, too. I mean, they're out there saying he's a cop and he tried and he tried to rape two women. But does that mean that Ricardo Tubbs is not? <laughs> I, I have guess to think Channel Three can get a picture of Tubbs, so they got a picture of Tubbs of, like eating a donut, and they're talking about him, you know, <laughs> accused know. of rape twice now. It's okay though because he's apparently not he likes redheads. He's Cooper. <laughs> it's okay. He's Cooper. At least when he goes undercover, he's Jamaican, unlike Sonny, <laughs> who's just himself. Oh, he should be Irish. That's what he should do. Go with an Irish accent. <laughs> <laughs> Later, Switek and the ladies are tailing Bill Bob after Crockett hauls Tubbs it's away. Like, I know you just... van. <laughs> Crockett's like, I know you just heard that you were accused of lewd acts again, but we have to leave and let other people take care of this. Please don't let angry Tubbs out. Keep him contained. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> I want my money. <laughs> Where is it? They're tailing him, and as Stan calls him, dressed as a sofa. And that Stan talking. That is some... That <laughs> right there is scalding. <laughs> Bill Bob's limo goes over to the rougher side of town, and Melissa, as you said... He has a special clothing he wears for that side of town, too. Yeah, he looks really junky over there. He's not wearing his Italian suits. <laughs> <laughs> his slumming clothes. <laughs> yeah, he's slumming it. <laughs> got my, my blue jeans and my blue shirt <laughs> and my big giant belt I keep pulling up. <laughs> oh, I forgot about Brian Denny. He, he's in Rambo. Yeah. I didn't do nothing. Oh, yeah. I'm going to drop you off on the other side of town. All right, see you later. I know. That's what I was thinking when you guys said like, <laughs> talking about that there's a bigger coaster. Like, like a bigger guest star. I'm like, whatever. I don't think that Ben Stiller's bigger now. Like if you take their two careers, yeah. just be at the time. Brian Dennehy would be bigger. Yeah, I still think Brian Dennehy's bigger. <laughs> just saying. At the precinct later, they're reviewing the footage from the tail, and he's trying to hide. Like he changed his clothes a bunch of times. He went in and out of buildings. They had a hard time following him, and then eventually found him doing real charity work for people. And Trudy explains, like, he used to do charity work in Ethiopia, too. Yeah, you know, he sounds like a really good guy, like, genuinely a good guy. So, I mean, maybe Tubbs really is a rapist. (laughs) (laughs) Maybe that's the only thing that explains it. (laughs) Crockett says, okay, let's start working other evangelists to see if anyone has any reason to try and bring him down. Because if he's such a good guy... If they try to make him out to be the devil, but he's actually a saint, then let's go work other evangelists and see if anyone else has a reason to not like him. I think that's far fetched, though, to, go, <laughs> to jump to that conclusion like right away. Mm-hmm. Isn't it? Like, don't you think mm-hmm. he would be like, he's faking it? He's fake. Like, he he knew he was being followed. So he's doing all this stuff, like, where he looks like he's 
super he's like a super nice guy he's not really that why didn't they, they why, i just don't understand why they or you that. start to consider the fact that maybe tubbs is guilty <laughs> yeah, I know. everyone's like that's why when they're when they talk about him being like no actually we followed him and we looked at his background he actually is a nice guy there all the women were like oh <laughs> Sky high and tubbs. Yeah, the women are giving tubbs a look like really i know i mean nothing's coming up on this guy maybe you really are a rapist <laughs> Well, also, when Crockett comes to that conclusion that they should go talk to other evangelists, he's taking countless quarters from Tubbs and failing to be able to operate a vending machine. <laughs> yes. So let's talk about how when Crockett was a kid that sodas used to cost 10 cents. Yeah. How and then let's you, realize Crockett? that after he drops about $3 of quarters <laughs> into these two machines, he walks away without a soda and without a bag of chips. <laughs> <laughs> Now they're going to go talk to a former evangelist, and this is Fast Eddie. They're going to go over to a shop. Fast Eddie is a true salesman. He is pitching someone to buy a glow-in-the-dark Bible <laughs> at his store. <laughs> he is working hard, and Crockett comes up, flashes the badge, and Eddie says, Hey, 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 all those little Bibles that are washing up on the shore here, that's not my problem. I sold them. I didn't tell that guy to let them float down the river in Cuba. That's not my – I didn't do any of that. And Crockett says, We'll come back to that. I'm not going to forget that. Yeah, we, I need to know about that later, though. <laughs> yeah, but we do want to talk about why would anyone have a problem with Bill Bob and who would that be? Fast Eddie's immediately says Mason Mathers. He passed on satellite because he didn't want to be on the same delivery as the Playboy channel. Or well, they call it the Bunny Channel, but they want to be on the on the Playboy Channel. But now he has mm -hmm. really high regrets and he wishes he could get yeah, a satellite he's, he's channel stuck again. selling tapes out of the trunk of his car. So the only way that Mason can get onto satellite is to get Bill Bob off of it. Fast Eddie, thank you. You gave us so much information that we did not have. Um, <laughs> you filled in our entire case for us. Thank you. Yeah, they built the whole case yes. on his testimony. <laughs> Fast Eddie, by the way, played by Ben Stiller. So Ben Stiller, son of husband and wife comedy duo and Mara and Jerry Stiller. Obviously, he's huge. I mean, everyone's seen there's something about Mary or Zoolander or Dodgeball. Or, I mean, you've seen something that he is cable guy. But for Ben Stiller, uh, his first actual like acting role was when he was in high school at age 15. He had a one-line appearance on the soap opera Guiding Light. In high school, he was the drummer punk band called Capital Punishment, and they even released an album called Rogue Kill in 1982. <laughs> and then after dropping out of UCLA in the mid 80s, uh, he made a mockumentary called The Hustle, uh, The Hustler of Money, which was basically a parody of Martin Scorsese's The Color of Money. And it was purchased by Lorne Michaels of SNL, and he aired it in 1987 on SNL. So wow. two years uh, later, Michaels offered Ben Stiller a job as a writer on SNL. He would take the job. In 89, he would write for SNL, and he would appear in four episodes. But he would leave after four episodes because SNL was putting pressure on him to stop making short films. He would leave, continue making short films with his friends like Andy Dick and Janine Garofalo, and MTV would come calling. And he would make 13 episodes of The Ben Stiller Show, which mixed comedy sketches with music videos and was canceled after the first season. <laughs> but that show would get him the uniquely named The Ben Stiller Show on Fox. <laughs> 82. Because <laughs> we can't be creative in TV. <laughs> so, and that would include Judd Aptow as, as a writer. And the cast would include Janine Garofalo, Andy Dick, and Bob Odenkirk. And that would last 12 episodes or one season. <laughs> So he would have bit parts here and there in between this stuff. But in 1994, rectorial debut would be a movie called Reality Bites. And he would also guest star uh, in it. It would be produced by Danny DeVito, who would work with him again on several other projects, including Along Came Polly. He would follow that up in 95 with an uncredited role in Adam Sandler's Happy Gilmore. You could trouble me for a warm glass of shut the hell up. 
<laughs> yeah. Hell yeah. And then he would go on to make Cable Guy, There's Salt Out Mary, and on and on. Zoolander. And actually, Dodgeball and Zoolander would also co-star his wife, Christine Taylor, who you would know from those movies, but you might also know as Marsha Brady in the Brady Bunch movie and a very Brady sequel you might not know about his wife christine taylor is that she is she was also on hey dude Mm, i remember that (laughs) right in between the pete and pete and sucha shorts power hour (laughs) (laughs) well the duo are off after talking to fast eddie to go talk to mather and mather isn't there but they talk to one of his other cronies that are there and they get stonewalled and crockett says hey you should have him give me a call or i'm gonna get a warrant and the other preacher says okay yeah i'll let him know also by the way you should watch his sermon tonight all right see you later guys bye because it's gonna be about he says because it's gonna be about you (laughs) (laughs) so then the duo naturally head over to the bar to go watch the sermon (laughs) <laughs> that's the <a> natural progression <laughs> they asked the bar to switch it over to the channel and they see just a couple of minutes where Mather says Bill Bob will be struck down by God and his ministry will die in a fire and then he collapses himself <laughs> <laughs> and now we get the dueling angelist because I mean obviously Reverend Bilbo can't be outdone <laughs> so he's got to go out and talk some some smack too because some doo-doo heads talking crap <laughs> By lightning and stuff. <laughs> Bill Bob insists on going on live. He and he wants to tell his viewers that Mather's full of shit. Like Basically. that's that's all that he's there to do. Now let me set the stage here. Up until this point in the episode, <laughs> this has been a great episode. It's actually covered TV evangelism very well. Having Tubbs be accused of this crime and that wrinkle into their investigation and stuff has been really good. The acting has been good. Brian Dennehy has been good. Everything has been going so great. And then, (laughs) in the middle of Bill Bob's sermon, lightning strikes the satellite dish outside of the studio. It then causes an electrical spread throughout all the equipment inside of the studio and ruins everything, but doesn't hurt anybody. And it looks like a fantastically cheesy special effect. It's like something out of Master's Universe. Yeah, it's bad. (laughs) (laughs) I cannot describe this well enough for how uncomfortable and shocked I was seeing that happen. (laughs) And then what continues in this episode makes it that much worse. <laughs> yeah, and it gets so confusing, too. Because it's like like none of this makes sense to explain the whole th- first three quarters of the episode at this. Uh, like, this ending just doesn't, no, doesn't we, do it justice. Because it's like, like what, what did any, either of them have to gain at this point? I don't know. And I'm going to give you an example. At the next scene, the duo show up at the hospital and they want to talk to Mather. And Tubbs specifically says that they want to talk to him about his criminal use of lightning. (laughs) Yes. Attempted murder with lightning. (laughs) They get taken over to the room of Mather and he's still unconscious in a coma in the hospital. So he couldn't have done it. (laughs) <laughs> Typical. I don't believe it. Shake him. He's not in a coma. <laughs> now, this is when it gets the best. And this is the best as in in all the wrong ways. <laughs> we head back over to IGG. Leona is high as a kite, picking through the garbage. The duo show up and they're talking to Bill Bob, who is pissed. He figured this was a Mather deal. That's the only person who would attack him like this. <laughs> what? Question mark. Of course. <laughs> and... While talking to the duo, he applies his electrical engineering degree and says, if it were me, I would have wired it so that uh, everything would have overloaded. You could easily do it by doing it this way. Let me show you guys. (laughs) (laughs) He says that someone. And that's when they all figure out he did it. (laughs) (laughs) He says that someone had to have allowed this through because the breakers and the surge protectors and everything should have stopped. The insurance won't cover the damage. So, and also his flock thinks that God tried to strike him with lightning. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, that's a problem when you're a preacher. (laughs) Also, they're still charging his wife. Yeah, Yeah, they're not backing down from that. Yep. Switek comes in and says that he found a lunchbox in the back with a liverwurst sandwich still in the microwave. And Bill Bob says, my night engine engineer always has liverwurst for lunch or dinner whatever you want to call it because he works 
overnight. And that he's also the engineer. So he set up the studio by removing the surge protectors as if they planned this lightning attack. Yeah. I mean- Somehow <laughs> Mathers talks to this engineer and this inside job. To set up this lightning strike <laughs> on the studio. <laughs> uh-huh. Are you sure we have to wait until episode seven when this show jumps the shark? Is, are we witnessing it happen right now? Uh, I think you're witnessing it. <laughs> Let's get to the chief engineer who likes his liver worst. So they show up at the restaurant, at, at this restaurant, and they get the waiter to point him over. And they ask, you know, which one of you is Steve? I don't remember his name. I didn't write it down. (laughs) He takes off running to the roof, which is the worst choice for an escape (laughs) plan ever. When the duo catch him, they threaten to throw him off the roof until he gives them more information. And he says that he took money to lower the amperage restrictions through the breakers and the surge protectors. So that everything would get damaged, but wouldn't kill anyone. And that he also helped Mather get the audio into Faye's Walkman so that he would say that God told her to do it. These are all real. My arms are waving above my head. These are all (laughs) real things that happened in this episode. That they planned this lightning strike (laughs) and that they sabotaged Faye's Walkman. So she thought God told her to set up Rico tubs for rape allegations to bring down Bill Bob. These are all facts. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, let's, let, all right, guys, let's just, let's just wrap this up. Let's just go back to the hospital. We'll arrest Mathers and we'll just call it a night. Yeah, what do you yeah, say? He can't get weirder than this. He's charged with criminal lightning. <laughs> <laughs> They're going to go criminal bring him lightning. in. <laughs> When they get there, they get taken up to the roof, and Mather is climbing a radio tower and totally out of his mind. Still in his like hospital gown, he's like, but he because he cat- came out of his catatonic state just in time for the lightning strike, then got up and climbed the <laughs> and pole. Tubs. No one stopped him though. Like, can't you can't you tackle him or something before he gets up there? Well, Crockett offers that Tubbs can go up yeah, there and no. go get him. <laughs> Tubbs is like, yes, uh-huh. that's fantastic. <laughs> yeah, hey, Tubbs will come up there. <laughs> oh, but no, uh, Tubbs breaks out his uh, his electrical knowledge and explains to Crockett how if anything, any buttons get pressed, it's going to send a bunch, a boatload of current into that radio tower he's climbing. It's going to shock the heck out of him. And Crockett's like, how do you know? And Tubbs is like, because of night school, because life after vice. <laughs> and, and now... Is everyone in this electrical class? Like, is this a popular class? Everyone seems to know a lot about electricity at this point in the episode. <laughs> Mather then says he's being called by God's bosom, which is the firing, and electrocutes himself to death. Yes. And I'm going to come back to all this Tubbs information, Sean, and my final thoughts, because that's the okay. only saving grace of this episode is that there are, we get to learn more about Tubbs. <laughs> yes. Like he's in night school. <laughs> what are we learning in school? Why would he be taking classes on electrical engineering? <laughs> what is his plan? <laughs> Tom's going to start flipping houses or? <laughs> so now we have our last scene of the episode. Okay. We, head, we head back over to IPP. Bill Bob, he comes out onto his damaged set. He's in a normal suit. Not his fancy Italian. Flashy Italian. <laughs> he says he's still got his health. He's still got Leona. That he's selling all of his stuff in his houses and stuff to pay for the damage in the studio. To send Leona to drug rehabilitation. He sounds like he's changed his tune. Right? Everything's good. And then 1-800-555-LOVE yeah, yes. flashes on the screen. And please send us nine ninety five to go away. <laughs> Tubbs and Crockett are working late at the precinct and they see leona and bill bob on tv bill bob asks leona to sing a song and then the money starts to pour in by the time the duo turn it off it's up to like forty thousand dollars no like a hundred and forty thousand dollars like a hundred and forty five thousand something yeah Mm -hmm. and crockett says the best thing about tv is you can turn it off freeze frame end of episode yeah yeah so about that (laughs) ia rape investigation just you know well, that's what so I'm, she passed that's what, the polygraph i know we've got a witness <laughs> I have, she wasn't the only one that accused though i have so many thoughts 
I'm going to save them all for my final thoughts. I'm not going to give any of them away here. But I, those are some of my questions, though, John. Like, what about the rape yes. allegations? <laughs> yes. What happens now? <laughs> yeah. Does it go on administrative leave? Like, how does that work? <laughs> but before we get there, let's go take a look at this week's music. Because this time, this time, John, no repeats. New artists. Oh, yeah. Let's go talk about this week's music. All right, John, I'm actually excited because we've All got right. new artists, people we haven't heard of before. Yeah, we've actually got some new music for once, some new artists, and you know, I, probably my favorite part, no connections to anything uh, <laughs> in the past music. <laughs> it's completely new. So let's learn something. So let's uh, we're going to talk about these in backwards as far as the order they were played in the episode. Uh, I'm going to talk about Rankin Files' Black Book first pink and file it is a punk rock formed in 1981 in austin texas by chip and tony kinman this is taken directly from the biography so this isn't my opinion <laughs> let's make that they clear took, they took the rawness of punk aesthetic and applied it to with ambience of country western and created the subject called cow punk <laughs> Yes, people, cowpunk is a thing. They released three studio albums before breaking up in 1987. In 1981, Chip and Tony uh, Kinman split up their influential political punk band. Once again, taken from the biography, I'm not saying it was influential. They're saying it was influential. <laughs> their influential political punk band, The Dills, and they left Carlsbad, California in the dust. They went to New York City, but after after just a few months in New York City, they somehow ended up in Austin, Texas. Once in Austin, Texas, they joined forces with Alejandro Escoveta of the Nuns to form the band Rank and File. Chip Kinsman would later recall that people were grossed out their music. They would go into <laughs> new wave clubs and play country, and they would never be asked back. So after their L punk days didn't didn't work out to big success, they would try a synth pop band called Blackbird, and then the Kinsman brothers would eventually return to the cowpunk genre with the band Cowboy Nation. They would release their debut album in 97. Hey, if uh, you're going to make cowpunk music, you have to do it where the cows are. So, of course, you end up in Texas. Oh, no. no. Oh, by the way, Cowboy Nation, new cowpunk band, well, in 97, new, debuted on an Australian uh, record label. Australia makes music? <laughs> yeah. Apparently, they like cowpunk. <laughs> Escovedo would form a band called the True Believers before going solo. Believe it or not, Alejandro Escovedo would actually go on to be a, a much more accomplished accomplished artists but that doesn't stop chip and tony kinsman from touring and and making music they took a well chip took a big break and then last thing i saw was that he had started a new band in a similar genre with i think his his kid or either his kid or someone else's kid that brings us to the song satellite by the hooters the Hooters are American, an american rock band from philadelphia they are a combination of Elements of rock, reggae, ska, and folk music. That's an interesting <laughs> mix. It's a pretty random mix. We've got some. We definitely got some interesting bands here. The Hooters apparently were got pretty heavy heavy radio play in the mid '80s, and actually got pretty good MTV rotation out of it too. Their most notable songs are "All Zombies," "Day by Day." And where do the children go? The Hooters were formed by Rob Hinman and Eric Bazilian in 1980. Rob and Eric actually met in 71 at the University of Pennsylvania, where they formed a band called Baby Grand and released two albums on Art Artiste Records. They would form the Hooters in 1980, and they would take a one-year break in 1982 after a Who Farewell tour that they opened with Santana and The Clash. And essentially, only the drummer would return to the band. The drummer, David Yusikinen, was retained from the original lineman, uh, lineup. John Kuzman and Bobby Woods had already joined the band Youth Group, and so they would be replaced with John Lilly, 
and Rob Miller from another local Philadelphia band called Robert Hazard and the Heroes. In 83, they would finally release their debut album, Amore. And in that same year, Rob and Eric would be asked to write, arrange, and perform on the debut album of this very unknown artist named Cindy Lauper. Ah, interesting. Yeah. They wrote, arranged, and performed on her album, So Unusual. Hinman actually co-wrote the hit song, Time After Time, and actually sang the lower harmony vocal in the chorus. In 1984, the Hooters would be signed to their first major record contract, but just before experiencing some mainstream success, bassist Robert Miller would be seriously injured in an auto accident and would have to be replaced by Andy King. What happened to Robert Miller after that? It's unknown, apparently, as I was not (laughs) able to find much. It must have been a serious accident. Never came back. (laughs) Just launched him into space. (laughs) It's okay. It's okay, guys. We got Andy King. (laughs) So 1985's uh, Nervous Night would be released and go platinum, selling 2 million copies. Also in 85, they would open Live Aid in Philadelphia. Uh, They would continue the success all the way through to the end of the 80s. And actually, this specific song that they did for Vice had a, a pretty famous video for it. The video for Satellites features a couple resembling the American Gothic painting and a young girl that plays what I'm assuming was her daughter. And the two are watching a Three Stooges episode and... It's mixed in with the Hooters trying to perform, but they're continually interrupted. So, and it's actually believed to conceal parodies of televangelist Jerry Falwell, Tammy Faye Baker, and Oral Roberts. Yeah, that can't be a coincidence, right? I don't know. You know, a song from the late 80s in this episode. But I don't know. It just seems kind of on the nose. Uh-huh. <laughs> a little on the nose. So, between 90 and 95, their popularity in the U.S. waned, but abroad, they were reaching new heights. So, essentially, beginning of the 90s, people stopped caring about them in the U.S., but they were huge in Germany. Um, <laughs> oh, another one of those bands, like when they were huge in Brazil, in Portugal. <laughs> yes, yes. So, and actually, following a London show in 1988, they had met Roger Waters. That would eventually lead to, in 1990, being included in Pink Floyd's staging of the Wall concert in Berlin. Damn. They would also record a live album called The Hooters Live in 93 that would be released in Europe and in Asia, but never released in the U.S. Yeah, we our popularity so waned over from there, 19- assholes. You don't get nothing. Yes, exactly. <laughs> you want a live album? Go to Asia. <laughs> from 95 to, to 2001 uh the members basically kept busy with other projects eric bazillion in 95 wrote and arranged joan osborne's debut album which was nominated for six grammys including song of the year one of us which bazillion wrote he would also release two solo albums himself hyman would actually open his own Philly-based record studio called Elm Street Studios. He would actually write, arrange, and produce many artists, the most notably being also Joan Osborne and this little-known artist named Ricky Martin. Yeah, who's that guy? It sounds so familiar, like he was just some <laughs> boy band. Can't put my finger on it. <laughs> like a soup? Yeah, yeah. It's like it's named after some food or something. <laughs> I don't remember. Ah, yeah, it's that, it's that <laughs> hangover soup. Menudo. Menudo. Yeah, Menudo. <laughs> that's what it is. <laughs> Menudo. <laughs> Drummer David Usikinen, he would move to San Diego, open his own record label, and he would also play drums for several pretty big artists, including Cindy Lauper, uh, Rod Stewart, and Alice Cooper. And in 1999, he would join a tech group who created an online musical portal called mp3.com mp3.com would be a place for independent and lesser known artists to be able to share music on the internet with people for free it would also be one of the beginning sites basically digital music and at some point a company called cnet would buy the name but the name only guitarist john lil bless his heart so here we have Bazillion working on Joan Osborne's album. We have Hidman producing Ricky Martin. We've even got the drummer being all techie 
and starting his own website, Taurus John Lilly would open a Philly-based landscape business called Avante <laughs> Gardeners. <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. That's where this would go. <laughs> yes. So John Lilly's a landscaper. <laughs> Just so, saying, John, you might have a place to go work uh, with if you move to Philadelphia. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So John Lilly, if you, if you have a job opening, I have a resume for you. So... <laughs> Uh, in November 2001, their first show together since the 95 hiatus, which w- would lead to multiple reunion tours, and eventually, in 2007, their first album of new material since their 93 live album called Time Stands, which apparently they are still promoting, and they even rec- re-recorded the songs uh, for an acoustic album. So We got Ricky Martin, we got Cindy Lauper, and we've got John Lee, the landscaper. I think we got plenty. <laughs> exactly. So, and there's your music. Well, like always, John, it always takes a turn that I'm not prepared for. Although I'm excited for you and your job opportunities in Philadelphia. <laughs> uh huh. I do like cheesesteaks. <laughs> All right, let's go give our final thoughts on this episode because it's going to be a doozy. All right, I'm going to kick off this week. (laughs) I'm a little fired up this time. Let me get it out. (laughs) As I mentioned, this episode was going great. I loved it. I was like, season four is off to a great start. I'm actually anticipating that we'll have, we may have a bad episode in the future, but season four might be okay. There's just a couple of really bad ones mixed in. So that's when people gave up on the show and it couldn't compete with Dallas anymore. And then we get to about minute 36 in this episode and it just tanks. It totally falls apart. And like I said, I was with it. And then lightning strikes the studio, and I realized that I wasn't riding a bike. I was riding a bike backwards towards a cliff. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And we just fall off the cliff here at the end of this episode. <laughs> Everything was going great. I had nothing to complain about. It was like we were walking along, and then all of a sudden I was like, oh, no, I pooped myself. <laughs> <laughs> keep up with how many things happen after the studio gets struck by lightning including criminal use of lightning (laughs) that's a thing we talk about in this episode this was going so great it fell apart i'm glad tubs has a there was a tubs episode in the very beginning of the season i don't know how often we're actually going to see him and we should really really investigate to see if anywhere out there has on the books a law that says that it's illegal to use lightning for criminal activity. <laughs> yes. <laughs> John, what are your final thoughts on this episode? I, I am right there with you, you know, like right about 36 minutes. I, the, the episode was going so well. It had drama, it had big, heavy topics, you know. We're talking about drug addiction and televangelists and the the – corruption and competition between televangelists we're talking about rape allegations false rape allegations against tubs it's got drama and everything and you almost had to know like they're running themselves off a cliff because there's just no way they can explain this at the end of the episode like like i mean by the time we get to the end of the episode they had put in so many twists and turns that nothing that had happened would have benefited anyone so it made no sense for anyone to be the criminal so it has to be a crazy guy that climbs a radio station <laughs> like king freaking Kong, and then uh, gets electrocuted and dies and like like that that's it that's it you know like the rape allegations go out the window Rape allegations are pretty seriously. Colonel Affairs was investigating. Even if you have a witness that's going to say, like, they put a Walkman on her to <laughs> convince her that, that God told her to make these allegations up, the the Bill Bob's wife already accused it, uh, Tubbs of doing the same thing, of sexually assaulting her. You know, like, like it just goes away. Like, they just fall off a cliff because it just, there was just no way that to end this and actually make it make sense. 
So, <laughs> can you charge the engineer with his orchestrated lightning attack, <laughs> or or putting <laughs> Mather's audio on her Walkman? Like, is he? Did he do anything illegal? What about Leona's charges? This, are they still going to bring her down for drug charges? I know she's going into rehabilitation, but they never said like what's going to happen. No, they said that they were gonna, still going to that she was still going to be charged no matter what. That was that was yeah, said. but we get no clothes on yeah. that. Like, <laughs> no, we don't. And I mean, at the beginning of all this, to, to think lightning attacks and <laughs> rape allegations and like all of this spun out of a drug possession. <laughs> even when they prosecute her she's probably gonna get like a week or like like a, a week in jail and like a bunch of community service this was a hell of a road to go down for probation but we got some new music which was fantastic and it featured a landscaper go john lily <laughs> uh, my favorite guitarist of all time now <laughs> We got some fantastic guest stars, including a very, very young Ben Stiller. So, Melissa, you're over there kind of laughing along, but also giving me the stink eye. What are your final thoughts on this episode? My final thoughts on the episode are that I love the episode. I think that that it has a crazy twist. And yes, it's like almost like someone's possessed. And I don't know. <laughs> he can control the weather. And I don't understand any of it. <laughs> but I'm I'm surprised that it's taken you guys this long to figure out. You're never going to get the ending you want. Like nothing is ever going to be wrapped up where they go like, hey, we're going to go to court. We're going to tell you because you know what? That's law and order. So watch Law and Order. If you want that, ending, you have to watch a different show because it's not going to happen. And every week you guys do the same thing. Well, how come they didn't talk about this? How come they? Because they don't have four hours for the show. <laughs> yes, but just ex- but please just let me in on your on the secret. Are they going to charge Tubbs with rape or not? No, I, I, not. Just answer that one question <laughs> for me and then we can go. <laughs> no, obviously they're not. We can not move on. God never told that girl. <laughs> it was, didn't you hear that part? Doesn't that clear it up? <laughs> but Bill Bob's a pretty guy. Tubbs might actually be a racist. We need to look into this. <laughs> This one definitely has questions to be answered. Like, why did that guy eat a bratwurst sandwich every night? I want to know that. That's more important to me. Why did they, why did they let that guy climb that tower? Who let him out of the hospital? What is going on with that? But I just think it's funny that every week we do the same thing and you guys are like, how come they didn't close this out? Because they don't close things out. They, they well, come to out. think of it. Hey, hey, come to think of it. How do you fake a coma in the hospital? I don't know. He's a televangelist. He can also probably heal people, too. Would you think they would figure that one out? (laughs) (laughs) Well, they didn't figure it out with uh, our guy that's slogging through oatmeal. Yeah, I mean, he was like half dead. He was going to (laughs) die. He still got Tubbs money, though. (laughs) Well, that's going to do it for us this week. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Go With The Heat. We would love to hear from you. Email us, goWithTheHeat at gmail.com. Be sure to check out that Patreon, patreon.com slash GoWithTheHeat. If you want to support your fellow indie podcasters, go check out that Patreon, patreon.com slash GoWithTheHeat. we got a ton of rewards. Be sure to check that out. Like I said, email us, GoWithTheHeat at gmail.com. You can get us on Twitter, twitter.com slash GoWithTheHeat, facebook.com slash GoWithTheHeat. You know the drill. Anywhere you see go with the heat, that's probably us. You want to get the show in different ways? YouTube, tune in, Apple Podcasts, Google Music Podcasts. I don't know. Keep asking for it on those little smart speakers you got in your house. See if they'll show up there. I'm working hard on it. I swear. I swear I'm working on it. I'm getting tech advice from Stan Switek, so we're not getting anywhere <laughs> fast. <laughs> But uh, working on it. <laughs> Please contact us and let us know what you think about this episode. Be sure to check out that website, go with the heat.com. You can find all the ways to contact us, all the ways to subscribe, all the notes from the show, including embedded videos of the music from every single episode. That's going to do it for us this week. We hope you enjoyed this episode, and we'll see you all next time. Bye, pals.